um, and some of the things that we work with. So I'm just going to take you through a couple different scenarios and demos of a little bit of ICS stuff that we work with uh, and sort of show you that like security is a different side. A lot of this stuff is integrated into your environment, whether you know it or not. Um, either through your HVAC system or your building automation system or just random things like uh, even the, the UPSs that connect or in, or in your server rooms will have uh, a lot of uh, sort of ICS protocols attached to them. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, between screen sharing and webcam because I want to show you the stuff that I have on my, my desk. Uh, but first, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with this software-defined radio um, because radio waves are cool and people don't really know how they work. Um, so I have a little tripod radio receiver here. Uh, it doesn't transmit any radio waves, but it can pick them up. Um, and it's a just a generic software-defined radio, uh, and it connects via USB, and we can pick up radio waves. Uh, I'm just going to sort of show you what they look like and show you how uh, how it sort of functions. So let me switch over to screen share, uh, sharing screen one. Okay, so I'm using the uh, the Control Things platform, which is basically a Kali Linux designed for ICS systems. Uh, it's put together by the InGuardians team, uh, which is an ICS sort of um, a security firm. Uh, so they manage this uh, and along. It used to be called Samurai for the win, um, but it's changing the control things. And all of this is available on GitHub, uh, as well as the examples I'm going to be showing you are demos that are also available on GitHub. Uh, so I have my control things platform open, and I just need to make sure that my, uh, uh, ooh, my computer has hit 100% CPU. Uh, did you chug the beer already? Did I miss it? Oh, yeah, I did not. Um, ah, you're the demo guys will not appreciate your lack of sacrifice. All right, thank you for <laughs> uh, <laughs> So let's just make sure that my USB connected uh, my webcam apparently is connected. Uh, So LS USB. Ugh. My Logitech webcam connected to my virtual machine. Let me disconnect that real fast. Uh, connect. Okay, so I'm going to use GQRX. Actually, uh, URH. Um, It's going to wait for it to shoot up. My hooking up this uh, radio to my uh, computer sometimes makes it uh, go to 100% CPU uh, for a little bit, which is always interesting. Uh, maybe someone I know hacked my, uh, my radio when I was at a hotel or something like that. Uh, I do like the fact that the second that I started the presentation, my computer decided to max out on uh, CPU cycles, but it's so not it's demo demo gods, man. Yeah, demo gods, yeah. My uh, my sacrifice wasn't wasn't good enough. Can we try turning it off and on again? I could turn off my computer. All right, so we have our <laughs> we have our uh, our universal radio hacker, which sort of just lets us get. Uh, access to a radio to sort of in any way. Uh, and then we can just start sort of looking at different broadcasting ranges of radio waves, uh, which are broadcasted on anywhere from uh, a couple hundred kilohertz to some gigahertz range. There's a lot of um, different radio waves and things like uh, audio packs, uh, home security systems, uh, your uh, garage door opener, your Nest, uh, a lot of home automation or security systems use radio waves, uh, remote 
webcams or security cameras might use radio waves. Uh, and you can pick up sort of all of that signaling. Uh, just two fundamental uh, pillars of radio waves is that one, no one can stop you from broadcasting uh, and no one can stop you from receiving. Uh, you can jam by putting out so much information that you might not be able to figure out what you're trying to receive, but no one can stop you from receiving and no one can stop you from transmitting. Uh, so what we're going to be looking for right now is uh, like just generic FM radio waves, which broadcast on the uh, sort of 88 to 107 uh, megahertz range. Uh, there's actually something in my home that broadcasts at 433, and I have no idea what it is. <laughs> Uh, and it just, it will spike every once in a while. And I think maybe it might be the garage door opener of like the community that I live in. But every once in a while, like this is the range that like spikes. Um, but we're going to switch this to 103 and then sort of uh, take a gander trying to find some, uh, oh, this is uh, 103 or let's go with 99M. Uh, Radio stations look, or radio waves that are constantly being broadcast look like nice little curves. So we're just going to be sort of looking for something like this um, and then remembering them. Uh, so like 99, actually, let me open a notepad. Um, so I don't really know what radio waves broadcast in my area uh, because I don't listen to the radio. Um, but 99.5 uh, 99 uh, broadcasts, and then we can sort of just poke around on the spectrum analyzer to like look at what radio waves are being broadcasted in the area. Um, the red shows the highest like peak of radio wave that's ever been broadcasted, and the black is what's currently being broadcasted right now. The reason that it's all staticky is uh, the planet is constantly being bombarded by background cosmic radiation, uh, and that is the static on your radio that uh, picks up in between channels is uh, cosmic radiation. Uh, I guess there's not a lot of radio waves or a lot of radio channels in uh, Aiken. So, uh, you might need to move. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know, Columbia or something. Uh, <laughs> so, 0.7 uh, is another radio station, I guess. And uh, let's see, it's still 102.7. Let me just, and uh, 104.3. And down here, at, in the purple area, you can see like sort of the, the the jitter on the, and you're looking for this pale color that shows a lot of different um, signals coming across. Uh, but we can take this and then we can go plug it into a different program to actually receive that radio communication. So we're exit out of uh, URH and then go into uh, GQRX. And because I don't know how to uh, mic in my uh, audio, I'm actually going to uh, switch my audio to my bad webcam, uh, which will allow you to pick up on the, uh, the radio. So. All right, this audio quality is probably much worse, but uh, we can start receiving and we can see the uh, core cells of your brain. So I don't know if this is coming on, coming through. Um, if you guys can hear, you know itself. Yeah, we can hear it. Yeah. Um, the way I think of epigenetics. Um, but we can start plugging in uh, different numbers. Ah, oh, geez, that's uh, way higher than I wanted it to be. And we can sort of thumb around looking for radio stations in our area, which looks like this hump right here. Uh, so 99.5 is a country station, good to know. <laughs> uh, and if my neighbors or your staff or your security gate broadcasted on a, on a radio channel, it would appear as a signal that we could record or capture the information. Is this a church show? All right. <laughs> that would be similar to like a police scanner or a police 
uh, you know, radio frequency you can pick up on and listen to? Yeah, so radio scanners uh, work on the same way. Actually, let me change my microphone back to something that doesn't sound terrible. Uh, so uh, police, scanners are, police scanners function on the same principle. Uh, we know what uh, radio frequency the police use. We, the police can't stop us from listening to them. So you buy a police scanner that is already fine-tuned into the radio frequencies that uh, local police officers use or state police use. And then you uh, sort of listen to them. Uh, I'm going to pull up a capture because um, I don't want to like uh, go find a or create a brand new um, uh, PCAP or radio frequency uh, raw data. Uh, I just downloaded one off of GitHub. Colsec does not endorse the use of police scanners for any illegal, ac illegal activity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, none of this to like. Uh, none of the things that I say is shared with the Department of Energy's uh, uh, mantra. Aren't there also restrictions for broadcasting? Uh, so uh, yes, uh, receiving there's you can receive all you want. Uh, broadcasting. There are certain radio waves that are like lengths or frequencies that are said like, you can't do this. So a great story about broadcasting is some soldiers in Korea were just, you know, one of, their, one of the guy's wives was going in to have like their, uh, he wanted to like talk to his wife. Well, he couldn't call because phones didn't really exist for you know like private use from you know korea all the way back to the united states uh and radio waves work on an attenuation sort of math so basically what they did was they got the you know the distance of radio cable and antenna that they needed to send a signal all the way back to the united states well radio waves sort of go to the curvature of the earth and then not any further but certain frequencies of radio waves bounce off the ionosphere, which is the lowest level of the atmosphere, uh, and will bounce off the ionosphere and the surface of the planet, like all the way back to the United States, which are not allowed to broadcast on because everyone can hear it in like <laughs> the world. So because of that, uh, AM waves are similar. So AM waves can go much further than FM waves because they get sort of ionosphere uh, reflection. So they were able to get, it was a 1.2 mile uh, long radio antenna that they just laid across the ground. Uh, and they were able to send a radio signal all the way back to uh, the United States from Korea using solely radio waves. Uh, so a lot of it is math uh, and sort of radio attenuation and how long your antenna is. The reason that I can't, uh, couldn't create a regular capture for you guys is that my radio transmitter and receiver, I can't put far enough away from each other to get good signal reading. Um, there is a problem where your antenna and receiver are directly next to each other. Uh, my desk is only so big and the uh, USB cables that I have are only so long. Uh, so I couldn't actually put them far enough apart, but I downloaded something off of GitHub uh, <laughs> uh, from our good friends at InGuardians. Uh, so let me uh, uh, sort of get to it. Actually, I think it's in uh, uh, no. Ah. Suddenly, I forget how to use the uh, how to use Linux. Uh, radio. Uh, um, yeah, the garage door opener <laughs> is something that I downloaded earlier. Um, basic modulation. And we are going to, what do we need? We need universal radio hacker. Okay. Uh, so, URH, file, open, uh, read frequencies, basic modulation. Did I not open either of these? Uh, why won't these open? <sighs> Dash forty three three. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Why is it? Uh, 
Da, 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 da. Bear with me for a moment while I remember how to uh, how to do my own uh, my own lab. <laughs> Ah, here we go. Uh, let's look at this first. OK, so uh, scroll out far enough. OK, so radio waves are side waves. And uh, they actually, all waves transmit in a, you know, a sinal pattern. But the way that you communicate information is wonderful ups and downs. So if we look down here in the binary, uh, when the wave is down, it's a zero, and when the wave is up, it's a one. Uh, and that is how radio waves transmit zeros and ones across the air. So you have your predicted radio wave, which is going to be this sort of center curve. And then every time it deviates from the center curve, it's, it's a one. And every time it's on the predicted wave pattern for whatever megahertz it's being transmitted at, it's a zero. Uh, and that's the sort of signal of zeros and ones and then the the space between them is how you transmit you know double ones or double zeros depending on what's up at top and to sort of get this into ascii format we need to like do a little bit of detective work so noise is uh that sort of interference so we have a y scale that helps us figure out what the noise level is um, and then we have to sort of attenuate it down and make sure that this red bar which is going to be our program's sort of noise filter, uh, encapsulates all of the noise, but doesn't remove anything from the signal. Uh, so 0.3 is a little large uh, based on this scanner. So we could, or 0.326, we could probably go to 0 0.30, maybe even 0.25 uh, to just get a little bit crisper of a signal. And then we need to figure out what the bit length is. So the bit length is the distance between the the peak of a uh, a modulation and because which means it's amplification, which is why it's up and down. So we need to figure out the peak. and it looks like it is roughly twenty six. Um, so after like configuring our sort of uh, program to sort of read the correct radio wave. It just says hello world like a ton of times, um, which is what this entire pattern is. It's just broadcasting out hello world on an AM si signal versus uh, FM, which is uh, fre frequency modulation, which looks a little bit different because it's the space between peaks and how they are arranged that actually communicates information. I of course have already cheated, and I'm pretty sure it's brought. It, I it's the same software uh, that broadcasted this. Um, oh, that is what a spectroscopy looks like. Uh, analog ASCII. So on FM, it's you crunch uh, radio waves together, uh, and on AM, you sort of deviate from like the correct sinal co uh, curve. And this is how you would sort of like reach out and pick up radio waves versus. Uh, you know, sort of just receiving them. You can actually sort of accept things like garage door handlers or um, key fobs on cars use radio waves a lot of the time if they're not using Bluetooth. And you can accept them and then you could replay them or attack them or try to figure out what they mean by changing the radio um, receiving program to sort of read the information. Because it doesn't really matter how well you modulate or you change, like, Radio waves are extremely readable. Uh, and encrypting radio waves is really hard because you have to receive a radio wave and then unencrypt it. And that is a lot of CPU on low power devices like a radio. So almost always they're on either a spectrum hopping, which isn't actually encryption, it's more obfuscation, or they're just broadcasted in plain text. And most things like garage door handlers or garage door openers are broadcasted in complete plain text. So we're going to take a look at a PLC. So let me uh, jump back to my uh, my webcam. Perfect. So uh, quick question about the security of all this, right? So it seems 
really, really simple to just be able to capture that information, right? Like I live in a neighborhood, I could throw up a throw up an antenna and just receive, you know, signals coming in and assume if I assume that, you know, people get home at five, I feel like I could profile the net the neighborhood pretty easily and be like, oh, that's uh people getting home open up garage doors, right? Like what yeah. keeps this from being a bigger deal than it actually is? Because like if you open up my garage door, I mean you can make off with, I don't know, my stuff, right? Uh people don't do it. That's really okay. So that's uh, yeah, that's yeah, really yeah. just the answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, okay. It's not like a. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a it's a pretty simple thing to do, uh, and it's it's not hard. the The hardest part is actually replaying it. Um, I have a yardstick which is like fifty dollars on Hack Five, which will allow me to broadcast radio signals. So I could capture like capture a signal, then duplicate it, then broadcast it on the yardstick. Uh, and I can open up my neighbor's garage doors. So, and the the worst thing is that I live in a community of identical townhouses. So there's a good chance that even using my own garage clicker, I might be able to open it up to someone else's garage door because there's only like a couple thousand frequencies that they program those with. So they're not technically unique. Um, you might be familiar with uh, people being able to open other up other people's Priuses with their key fob because they only program like a thousand and frequencies. And just I, I worked, two people. Yeah, I worked with a guy at uh, DEW and we got out of his car from going to lunch and he went to lock his car and I realized that it had actually locked the car two cars over and we played <laughs> with it for a couple of minutes and we were unlocking and locking both cars simultaneously with the keyless. Um, but yeah, I mean, think about it from this perspective. How complex is it to pick the front door lock? From a technology standpoint, it's trivial. It's, I mean, I need a couple of pieces of straight metal and a little bit of time to finagle with the lock and I can get right in. This is the electronic version of the same thing. Yeah, I suppose you're not wrong. Yeah. Uh, so I have a Velocio PLC. Um, it's about $50 or retails for about $50. Uh, I PLCs tend to be really expensive, so I have one here that's on loan from work because I work from home. That's like seventeen grand. Don't run my house. Uh, and this one's about fifty bucks. Uh, Velocity <laughs> makes way. really good. Where do you live? Where do you live again? What about the garage door? <laughs> <laughs> um, did you know that a Glock seventeen can hold nineteen rounds? It can be one <laughs> <laughs> um, Completely unrelated. So. So Velocio PLC is a really nice serial PLC. It's uh, Velocio makes uh, products for learning and teaching about PLCs. So if anyone's ever interested, I mean, obviously shoot me a message and we can talk about this all day long. But if you ever want to buy your own sort of like home kit, uh, Velocio will help you out. They sell things for about 50 bucks. Um, but this is a uh, six in, uh, six out uh, serial PLC. So I have a little switch panel hooked up, a little switches hooked up to each of the coils uh which allow me to flip bits on and off uh and i'm just going to plug it up and i'm going to sort of walk through how the plc works and then uh show you that transmitting information to the plc is about as easy as uh just connect to the network hi <laughs> now let me unplug my radio because the radio gets extremely hot uh because electricity is how and maybe this is too targeted so, so and maybe i'll just use an example from my history so i worked at scana for a little while um and with the uh, e in the ems department if you will um wasn't involved with plcs and, and the controllers and everything but how common is it that those devices would be controlled via radio wave uh almost every electrical substation is controlled via radio waves um, in a chemical plant, most things are controlled via serial cable, like copper wire, except for in hazardous environments, they use radio waves to get certain centers. Uh, they use wireless heart, which is a type of radio wave in wireless communication. So it depends on the where you, where you are. Uh, I know a lot of nuclear facilities use radio waves to transmit wirelessly out of contamination zones. Uh, it, it, Electrical, the, the electrical utility sector definitely uses radio waves more than the rest of uh, critical manufacturing, but it definitely depends on 
either it's a, a plant by plant. Yeah. So my level of concern has just risen dramatically based on the prior conversation we just had about garage door openers um, and Prius keys uh, it being controlled about by, by radio waves and that previous statement. Is that a fair? Um, is that a fair concern? No, because there's there's technical controls in place. Uh, I there's also the law. Yeah, the okay. law protects you. Uh, so you, so ICS is. I don't know if anyone's looked at the Lockheed Martin kill chain, but that's six steps. The ICS kill chain is ten steps because there are physical controls in place. Now I could hack right. like a wa the water utility and say like, hey, we should use a pump to like pump extra water into the water tower until it explodes. Uh, except for water towers are open on the top; they just have a physical lid on top of them. Because if it fills up with too much water, it just spills over the side. That's a physical control that is impossible to defeat from a cyber perspective. And if your engineering staff is doing their job correctly, you should be engineering processes from a physical standpoint, not a control standpoint. So you should be doing things like brake valves, um, check valves to prevent backflow, um, pressure release discs in case the pressure gets too high. There's a venting mechanism. Uh, there's usually a well. So if you're in a chemical facility, uh, any chemical tank has a well around it made of concrete to catch leaking chemical fluid. So there's a lot of physical controls in place that you have to defeat from a control perspective. And a lot of my work is dedicated on chemical processes. Here's your chemical process and here's your uh, you know, your technical controls and your, uh, your computers and your control system and your SCADA system. And this is how you would sort of, this is your weak point. And I, it's not doom and gloom. It's not, uh, you know, someone's going to shut down the power grid one day. Now I would say that I could get everyone here together and I could lead you through like shutting down the local substation and we could probably do it for like a day. Um, but they're just going to send engineers out there and they're going to flip it over to manual override. They're going to jump the breakers and then we won't be able to do anything about it. And they'll probably know it's us. Um, if we want to take <laughs> yeah. the power grid down for like a week, we're going to have to start coming up with like a very long, like formed attack plan and a lot doing a lot of reconnaissance and trying to learn more about the business environment. So it's not something that you can just sort of willy nilly do. And uh, so I don't want to alarm everyone. But if you do find a plant that is doing things irrationally or incorrectly and they are for cybersecurity, can cause some real uh, damage. The attacks where uh, people are bringing down systems for weeks at a time are those attacks where they're like actively damaging equipment, right? But like they're going to cause a pump to stay on when it should be off to overpressurize a line somewhere and cause something to explode, right? Uh, yeah. Like um, they're, they're physically they're they're using the electronics to override safety mechanisms that actively damage mechanical parts, and that's the thing that brings something <laughs> offline. For yes, so if we're going to talk about like Ukraine, for example, right. Ukraine attack was that they figured out the exact um, remote like. Um, radio gateways that they connected to substations from the main control center. And then they downloaded bricking firmware onto them remotely so that they couldn't radio into their substations anymore to unflip the breakers. So what they had to do was they had to put guys in trucks with handheld radios to go manually flip breakers. Um, and uh, uh, from the Ukraine attack, people talk about it being like the end of the world. It only lasted four hours. It only, Russia did the most complicated power wide scale power grid attack known to date and it only took the power grid off for four hours <laughs> in part of ukraine so not even the entire country um so it's not the end of the world but the more sophisticated the attacks get the more it could be but that's also because a lot of those systems are they have digital controllers integrated with them but they're still largely like physical objects right i mean it's not like a computer controlling the grid it's like there's computers hooked into the manual controls for the grid right uh yes uh so this is what plc programming looks like uh it's a bunch of pictures and blocks 
Uh, it isn't nearly as complicated as uh, you know C++ or Java. Um, but you have sort of a, just a block that runs north to south and things that sort of act. So you got pauses and timers and things go zero and one. Uh, it's a really simplistic, it's kind of like scratch, uh, but this is what basically runs traffic lights, uh, your water pumps, some of your electrical substations are programs that look like this. Uh, and it's designed like this to be, because electrical engineers and utility operators are the ones doing the programming, not computer engineers or computer scientists or people with a programming background. Uh, so I'm going to uh, connect to my PLC and then I'm gonna download this program, uh, but I'm gonna be able to show you what it looks like uh, running. So. I need to actually flip on my switch because it is manually controlled. So I flip a switch, which pushes this through. Um, and this is a simple mixer. So it adds um, from you know pump one to pump two, pump three, and then it mixes for a couple seconds. So it turns pump one on for two seconds, then it turns pump two on for two seconds, and then it turns on pump three, and then turns off both pump two and three at the same time. And in a PLC, uh, it runs in a loop continuously for all time, and time is always moving forward. So you have to sort of sort of orientate yourself around that until you hit a reset, in which time goes back to zero. So when you move from state one to state two, uh, state two starts at four seconds, which means if you add two, you're at six seconds. Um, and inside of states, time time is a global variable that is shared between all states. So uh, using this sort of graphical feature, we can look at um how the program is running and then if we want to sort of eavesdrop on it we can use something like device um monitor uh which i have right here and we can start to sort of like even decode what the plc is accepting in communication and off and on um, so i will set up device monitor to monitor the communication between the program and the plc how they're communicating back and forth uh no i don't want any updates so I want to COM port three is the one that the PLC is communicated to. Uh, generic, and I want to look at packet view start. All right, so we see a lot of like reads and writes uh, back and forth. Uh, and something that we notice is that every packet starts with 56 uh, FF, FF00. And that is the four bytes that indicate that you're talking to a Velocio PLC. Uh, if this was a Schneider Electric or an Emerson or a Modicon PLC or an Allen Bradley, you would have a different, that's basically a Mac, the MAC address um, of that PLC. So you'd be able to sort of read that back and forth. So we can start to look at things like uh, hitting stop and start and stop and start. Um, and seeing what those look like inside the PLC. Um, so uh, we can tell like 1D and 49 are just common reads and writes. They're not anything special. Uh, so 07F102, well, that's happened when I hit the stop key. Um, so what happens when I hit the start key, right? Something crazy happened. I need to drag this down to get it to catch up. Stop. So we're looking for things that are abnormal from the rest of the, the signal base. Um, and we could do things like turn on debug mode and turn off debug mode. The idea would be if you were doing or sort of programming out an attack, you would figure out what devices they had, and then you would go purchase the device on the market, uh, and then trouble troubleshoot it in your own lab to figure out all of the commands. Or you could do just simple Google, and all of these come in giant, a uh, couple thousand page documentation of literally everything you could possibly want to know about the protocol. Uh, so just looking at it, obviously I've cheated because I ran through all these labs earlier. Uh, 07F102 and 07F101 are start and stop commands. And then F001 and 02 are 
debug commands, and then 06 is your reset command, which means if we connect to the PLC on the network, we can just start and stop commands to it whenever we want. I need to make sure that my PLC is running before I uh, connect to it. But I guess I could start it from a. So I'll open up my VM, go back to my uh, control platform, and make sure that I can see my PLC, which is still running. So I will switch to webcam shortly to show you that it switches between serial communications. So. Uh, stop screen share. All right, so I have a single switch flipped on, which is the start switch. Um, and it has these lights down here. So this is the light, the input light saying like, oh yes, we are, we are on, the, the, the switch is flipped to go. And here is it running through the states. So it goes, it's a 15 second loop and it is uh, sort of stepping through these states independently of each other. So it runs the intake valve, turns on all three pumps, turns off the first pump, turns off the second pump, turns off the third pump in coordination with their mixer. Then it starts the mixer. And then the last thing is six is a flush valve. So if we wanted to flush it, we could, uh, which would restart the process from the beginning. So now we can just send commands to it. Uh, share screen. So. We can open up uh, CT Modbus, uh, uh, which is a program that allows you to just use Linux to send Modbus commands uh, over the, the network. So we need to connect to RTU because RTU is a serial connection. And we're connecting to this via a serial COM port rather than over IP. Uh, if this was remote, we could do it IP, except for the Velocio PLC doesn't have the capability to be an IP um, PLC. It's strictly serial. Um, so we want to uh, on slash dash dyacm0. OK, perfect. Uh, sessions opens. Uh, that was the, uh, the one thing that I was afraid the demo gods would break, because depending on when you plug in the USB, it gives you a different uh, uh, COM port on Linux. <laughs> so now we can send any hex commands we want. So we know that uh, 56 FF FF 00 is for Velocio PLCs, uh, and 07 uh, F101 is uh, the start command. So anytime we send this, uh, let me delete some of these spaces. Send hex. Please send hex. Why is it not repopulating? Please do hex. Yeah. Is it sudo. Sudo. Okay. <laughs> Calm down, guys. <laughs> Wait, did it not give me a good connection? Do I zero? Okay, let's close session first. Uh, help. Okay, let's let's go down. Do, 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 do. Perfect. Uh, read coils. Okay, so let's look first. Uh, we can read coils. So reading coils is the um, coils are basically your one and zeros on a PLC, uh, and this tells me that the first address, which is zero is on, which is the, the, the switch on uh, on my PLC in front of me, is on and everything else is off. Uh, if I flipped on it, all the other switches, which don't do anything except for switch six, uh, doing the same thing will tell me that zero through four are on, um, and so on. So this is how you figure out sort of what the values are. Um, send hex should work. I just don't understand why it's not. Um, let me open a new tab. Uh, connects. Uh, 
slash dev slash tty slash zero and send. Ah, here we go. Send hex. Uh, 56 ff ff 0007 uh, f101, which is the start command, uh, which my PLC is already running. So I can now send stop commands to it to stop it from running. Uh, even though that the switch is flipped on currently, it isn't running anymore. Uh, which I can uh, show you here. So it has a switch saying that it's on, even though it isn't currently processed anymore because we sent a stop command straight to it. Uh, so now the PLC, even though as a user operator, if you were sitting in a plant, you'd say like, oh, it's turned on. Like, of course it's turned on. Well, we just directly send a stop command to it. So now I can send a start command to it. If I click back on my window, and it'll start running again. Uh, and then if I want to, I can reset it at any given time by sending the 06 command, and it will go back to the first light. Uh, and I'm just setting straight hex code directly to the PLC. So it bypasses all of the sort of physical aspects of your controls. Um, and just go straight to this CPU processor. But that's because I have a connection to it. Uh, if this was on a TCP connection, I could just I can route it to the IP address instead. Uh, I just don't have that currently set up for you. Is it is it overriding it, or is it just you're you're also yeah. controlling so, it? Through. So PLCs typically don't have any authentication, so you are sending signals directly to it. So it PLCs work on a last in the first out mechanism. So whatever the newest signal that it received is, is the one that is correct. So uh, if I send a stop signal um, to the PLC, it's going to stop here. But if I flip it back on and off, it should start running again. Um, OK. So that's how, the like you said, like in Ukraine or whatever, they're able to manually override. You know, If they're physically there, they can, they can basically set it all back on. They, uh, yeah. they, so, they can regain control if they're physically there. They can they can flip the breaker and and you know turn pumps on or off or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So uh, so you can sort of just flip things on and off. Uh, there are PLCs run programs. So if you stop them from running, they won't actually run code anymore. Uh, it's rather complicated to get into like why they do that. Um, it comes from the fact that like PLCs existed before computers existed. But uh, we can look a little bit more at microcontrollers. I have one more demo uh, sort of explanation setup uh, that goes over microprocessors uh, and how those work. So PLCs don't have any authentication, which means if you can connect to them, you can usually send them their direct hex commands if you can find those online, uh, which almost all of it is available in documentation. So you can just send commands directly to them, which is what most of my research is focused on, is adding authentication to PLCs without degrading the network, because everyone is concerned about the safety of the chemical plant. Um, adding a lot of overhead to these um, little, small, embedded computers. They don't want it to lag, because if you're trying to send a command to shut down the valve, uh, you don't want it to lag, because it needs to make sure that you're authenticated or not. Yeah, you don't want, you don't want the operator to be fumbling trying to remember his password just so he can shut the pump off which is why most operators use a common password yeah um and most operators share an account so this is a microcontroller uh it, it exists on most of your motherboards it's a little like black thing that uh is embedded under the uh under the motherboard and either does your like sound card or your audio or controls your usbs they're pretty low power um have maybe you know 100 uh, kilobytes of memory, but they do very basic things. Uh, this is one that is not hooked up to anything. I have it as a demonstration because hooking it up takes a rather long time, and I didn't want to do that on. Uh... <laughs> I didn't want to do that on a rip stream. So and now you can't because it's broken. <laughs> uh, these things are very durable. So it has eight eight little pegs on it. Uh, it has its model number on the top of it, which I can't read anymore because it's dark in my room. But I do have already pulled up the documentation on it because I cheated and was pre-prepared. So pulling up the, let me share my screen again. 
and we will pull up the page. So almost every microcontroller or every microcontroller either works off of five volts or 3.5 volts. Uh, and you need to know a little bit about it before you hook up to it. So this is the data sheet. I Googled it, it's 36 pages long. Um, and I am going to be using a bus pirate, which I also should have shared. So let me just back to that real fast. This is a bus pirate. Uh, bus pirates are about 50 bucks, uh, maybe 30 bucks. Um, and all it does is it has this nice ribbon cable, which I pulled apart, um, and then has these nice little clampers that allow you to clamp wires onto the individual pegs of the microcontroller without, um, you know, bridging between two pegs, because otherwise it wouldn't work. Um, what I had to do earlier was look at the documentation to figure out which peg did what thing. So which one was a hold current, which one was the power, which one was the ground, which one was the... Uh, allow read or write, um, and which one pushed in memory and things like that. Um, and then I hooked it up, looked at the bus pirate documentation and said, which one of these wonderful cables did what thing? Um, and then I attached that color cable to the corresponding peg on the microcontroller, which will allow us to dump, read, and write um, directly onto the microcontroller. Uh, if this was already embedded onto a motherboard, I would use uh, medical syringes are really good because you can like poke them into the uh, silicon like uh, board, and they'll stay. Uh, and they also conduct electricity. So you can actually snake a wire through the syringe and then poke it into the, uh, the actual wiring on a motherboard to do this sort of reverse engineering uh, firmware stuff. I'll plug this in to the PLC um, and show you that we can read and write and pull off firmware from microcontrollers, because microcontrollers, once again, also have no authentication mechanism, which means you can do whatever you want to them once you get access to them. Right. I had to design this stuff. I just work in it. <laughs> here's, the, here's the page. So this is the actual microcontroller. Um, let me zoom in on it. So this is actually the microcontroller breakdown. So you have your hold current here. You have your VCC, which is going to be your either 3. or 5 volt uh, current. Um, and it's going to describe, and then there's these little notches at the top. That's a not that's solely there for orientation purposes because when you pick up these little mini uh, controllers, you don't really quite know which side is up and which side is down. So they, they they provide these little notches or circles to orientate yourself. So looking at this, uh, we can see that it's uh, 2.5 to 5.5 volts, which means that it will work with either 3.3 or 5. It doesn't matter. So we're going to hook it up to our um, uh, control things uh, uh, platform, and then we're going to uh, dump memory from it and write new memory to it. Uh, so just close these terminals and open a new terminal. So we have our terminal open, and we can use bus pirate. I can remember how to spell pirate. Uh, wait, is this not connected correctly? Oh, yeah. Um, LSTSB. Let me connect it so that I can see the bus pirate, and then it will work. Boo! Look at that. Works like a charm. <laughs> uh, so, uh, actually, uh, before that, let's go with exits. Um, help. Okay. Yeah. I was hoping that the help would uh would work, but I did all of this research ahead of time, so we have to configure the bus pirate um, program to talk to that actual microcontroller. So we want to talk on the one megahertz uh, like frequency. We want to talk. We want to make sure that uh, the polarity is correct, and then um, that it idles high. Um, there we go. We're ready. We're ready to roll. Uh, basically, you have to tell it you know what power you want, what clock it uses, uh, what electricity frequency that you want to communicate at. Um, 
and whether it idles high or low, because that determines what's ones and zeros, because the inverse is going to be the opposite. Uh, but now that we're here, we can make sure that our bus pirate is on and that we're ready to communicate, uh, because we are now charging the writable peg. Um, and we can now sort of read and write things. So uh, I copied some commands, just run with that real, fast. and now we can add to it. So uh, traces require us to uh, put things in brackets, uh, but you have a pointer, and that pointer moves through the memory space of the microcontroller, which means that at every time that we want to start at the beginning, we have to dedicate, we have to tell the pointer to go back to the beginning. Because if we didn't, uh, if I wrote eight bytes now, it'd write to the first eight bytes. And then if I wrote another eight bytes, it would write to the second eight bytes. So we have to dictate that it goes back to the beginning every time we want to write stuff over. So we can read things. Uh, that is an O, not a zero. Uh, so we can read things that will tell us what bytes are where. So the first, uh, eight bytes are these hex bytes. Um, and then but we can actually write or read all um, all the bytes in the entire uh, program, which is just a ton of zero Fs because that's what people fill their program with. It was at one time all zeros, uh, but when I was preparing for this, uh, it's if you don't write all zeros to an all zero uh, microchip, you don't know if you actually did it or not. So I, if, if it has Fs in it, I write zeros. And if it has zeros in it, I write all Fs. But actually, uh, the, the read function works is if we go over the limit of the total memory, it actually reads all of the memory, and then we'll read the first eight but characters again. And that's how sort of microcontrollers work. Uh, and PLCs are just a little bit more sophisticated microcontrollers. But we can actually just write things to the microcontroller now. And uh, bracket six is the quote unquote write um, function. So if we want to write uh, zero, zero, which tells it to write at the beginning, uh, we can actually write ASCII characters. So let's write colosec and send it. Cool, so we wrote Colasec, but we need to be able to make sure that we can read Colasec. So let's read the first 32 characters. All right, well, none of that says Colasec, but <laughs> it is in hex because that's what hex, you know, that's how, that's how computers function, right? They work completely off of hex, uh, which is why I conveniently pulled up CyberChef uh, with Colasec in it. So 43, 6F, 6C, 61, 53, 45, 43. Um, which is the first six characters in our hex code. Great. So now as we create our, you know, underworld criminal organization, we now know how to sign all of our firmware hacks with our own organization title. Ba -ba -da -ba. Colosec does not endorse signing your firmware hacks. For <laughs> 43.6F. <laughs> oh. The Cory police. I'm now. So we can actually dump uh, the entire memory of this uh, uh, microcontroller using this command, uh, which basically just says, "Like, here's the board. Here's the config file. Please dump it." Um, or this will allow us to launch. Okay. Oh, what did I do? Why is it not running? Oh, do I have to close out of the first? Yeah, probably. How's my open CD? Oh, it's not communicating on the rock clock speed. I don't know why. Um, all right, well, sorry. Um, <laughs> you you can dump the entire uh, memory image. I did it earlier today. Uh, I don't know why my uh, 
why it's out of sync right now. Um, and we can we can pull it up. Uh, we can pull up the, the the dump that I did a little bit earlier today. Uh, apologies for not quite understanding how the open OCD uh, function works, but uh, I did what every great security researcher does, which is why I went on to the dash help page on GitHub and learned how that command ran and then copied and pasted the things from their example. Uh, <laughs> like, like a true uh, security genius. Um, so I have the the, the flash bin, uh, which is the flash memory, the first 40 uh thousand characters or or bits sorry of the uh the program and uh i i saved it to launchpad slash flash because that is the uh uh so the um looking through this uh we can just see the random hex characters that are saved into the program now, if I had a decompiler, uh, I could feed this into the decompiler, and we could start looking at the assembly language of the uh, firmware. Uh, unfortunately, I don't currently have a decompiler downloaded or on this virtual machine. I have it on one of my other ones. Uh, but you could you, you could push this in to a decompiler, and then start looking at the more, and then push it into volatility or something like that, and then do a little bit more forensics information. But Physical access is really king, um, and this is just some of this extra information that you have from this presentation. Is that uh, you have radio waves which are transmitting from something somewhere in your environment? I assure you, uh, and you aren't doing anything to sort of curb the that's transmitting, which means that you know from a parking lot or pretty far away, someone's going to be able to pick up that that uh, radio signal. And then physical access is king. Uh, obviously, it takes a little bit of time, but if someone's able to sit down. Uh, and they know what kind of computer you have and what you're going to do. Um, and why supply chain interdiction is such a big deal uh, is that this stuff is not really easy to figure out. And if you are able to sit down, you can start reverse engineering the firmware and then start inserting malicious code. And only 892 bytes isn't that much space, but it's enough to put like a C2 channel. Um, and that's really the important part about firmware is that you can install like C2 channels in the sound card on a computer and then you know catch it in the fedex do a little bit of work on it for a day or two and then put it back in especially now that fedex every shipment is a couple weeks late uh but that's basically it i just wanted to like run through a couple little demos and demonstrations of like my work but also just sort of the stuff that you see on more of a level zero level one layer two uh that you might not be experienced in the enterprise environment uh, but it's most definitely part of your environment because you guys all have microcontrollers in your computers and you guys have building automation systems and HVAC systems and um, probably using radio waves to control some of those things. Um, anyway, just wanted to thank everyone for joining me for a beer and just running through a couple little demos. Yeah, I think you made a really great point about, you know, engineers creating other physical controls, you know, like the port at the top of a water tower. Um, you know, it, garage door openers or garage door, uh, you know, systems don't really have true controls except for the fact that, you know, there's not a lot of value in, in getting that and it's against the law. So there's a huge detriment to not do it. Um, cause the, from the vulnerability standpoint, like, um, Corey was asking about earlier, it reminds me of, or, or I, I think of. A similar thing like Bluetooth pairing. Like there's a lot of vulnerabilities around Bluetooth pairing. Like if you can intercept that communication between you know your phone and your car or your phone and your your new whatever Bluetooth device, they can intercept that and then now they can you know take over your device or or whatever. Well, sure that can happen, but it's not likely that you're going to be pairing a new device sitting in Starbucks or somewhere else like you're going to be at home or you're going to be at work or somewhere else that's generally safer from a physical environment um to where a lot of these things aren't really you know catastrophically you know they're not internet accessible you know your garage or other internet accessible by default you know these ics systems aren't internet accessible by default they can no it, not at all and configuration the same, to put them on the internet the same person that's 
able to like figure out how to do like a replay attack and copy and capture your garage door signal out of the air and then replay it also isn't the same type of person that typically breaks into homes right um <laughs> which is the big thing like if i could physically do it yeah but i don't want to break into anyone else's homes not only because like it's illegal and the downside for getting caught is way larger than the upside of breaking into someone's house i'm stealing a, a 200 dollar lcd tv yeah exactly you're making off a lawnmower or something right you you, you make you know 100 bucks at the pawn shop and you you know you you invested over a hundred dollars in all this equipment that you've shown us, <laughs> and you made off with a hundred dollars worth of stuff that you sold at the pawn shop, and then you get arrested, and you now are not only upside down in the expenses, but you're also in jail. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So our concern is being upside down, not being in jail. <laughs> <laughs> We're practical criminals. We're practical Kim. My investment. Oh no. <laughs> Yes, how do we make this profitable? That's the question. Yes. I mean, <laughs> I, I assume profit is is the motivation for most, you know, trivial break-ins. Um, so, yes, that's extremely important. That's why generally break-ins are, are trivial. They're, they're, you know, smashing windows or whatever. They're not hacking garage door openers and, you know, buying all this equipment and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm just going to go steal the package off your front porch. Okay, so I just want to answer a question that I saw in the chat. Uh, I meant to leave it up, but then I accidentally minimized it at the beginning of when I started talking, and then I forgot to ever open it again. The electric road signs on highways, uh, if they're the portable electric road signs, uh, they're actually connected to a handheld controller uh, that's in the box, which is almost never locked. <laughs> and if those are easy to open and mess with, for for comical reasons the ones on the highway are almost always connected via radio uh radio gateways back to a centralized like um uh like the department of transportation, department the of transportation. Ones, like, the ones so the, like a trailer yeah the, the trailer ones have a handheld device and they, they roll them out but the ones that are like on uh, overpasses and whatnot or on those signs that are over highways are right. radio controlled which is why they're really easy to hack and you know put up fun signals like you know uh zombie apocalypse ahead or something like that yeah hey, going back to kind of talking about physical proximity that you have to maintain because you know we're talking about radio signals i, I assume what, what kind of physical proximity are we talking a couple hundred feet like a you know within uh, a mile so radio and this is actually a big thing that comes up with 5g all the time uh unfortunately i don't have any of my 5g uh stuff here with me otherwise i'd be able to show you how it causes coronavirus but um, <laughs> uh so one of the big things about 5g is that the power of a radio antenna is directly proportional to how much power you push through a radio antenna uh, and one of the common attacks in the, the 5G mesh structure currently is if I'm malicious and we're in a mesh where you don't authenticate to a central server because we're peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, if I show up with a car battery hooked up to my radio antenna, all traffic will route through me because my signal is the strongest. Uh, if you want to make your home router have a better Wi-Fi signal, you can hook it up to an external power source that pushes more electricity through your router. Yeah, you'll probably fry it faster. But <laughs> you can you can extend your Wi-Fi signal up to a mile uh, if you wanted to share with the entire neighborhood, or if you just were really annoyed with the fact that your Wi-Fi signal like dropped off when you like walked out to get your mail or something. <laughs> um, your wireless and signal is directly proportional to how much juice you push through the object. So. Uh, depending on how much is being pushed through like your objects at your office or whatever, um, the signal will only broadcast so far. And then on top of that, uh, it depends on what materials are around. So you know, if you're in a brick building or if you're in a concrete building, not so great. If you're in a building that's mostly glass, that's awesome. Like that signal is going to go far. Um, so a couple hundred feet is uh, usually the rule of thumb uh, if you're using a radio broadcaster. Uh, you can usually send it, you know, uh, the parking lot is 
the best. Uh, you can usually pick up most building automation systems from the parking lot, uh, if it, as long as it isn't like a government facility, because uh, those have a little bit more stricter uh, RF uh, controls in place, like the type of walls that they built. Uh, most government facilities put RF panels in the exterior walls of the building. And so as far as like, I don't know, I, I don't want to say firewall because that doesn't make sense. It, w would it be worth it for substations or that sort of thing to put up some sort of signal booster or almost like a, a wireless Faraday cage, if that makes sense? It sounds like, it sounds like it's too far out there to make sense. but um, Substations have an entirely different issue. Connected to the substation is the pr problem. The problem is that most substations have a completely flat network from their radio gateway. Um, which is an issue. Uh, usually, you would connect to the radio, like to the substation, and then you would connect through some sort of security gateway into the like into that local control. Uh, so it's sort of like, yeah, we can let you get to the front door, but the front door's locked, right? Yeah, okay. that's been the traditional approach to radio communications. Um, if we harken back all the way to like World War II, right? The Enigma machine was a radio device. And when you broadcast radio signals, everyone can hear it. You know, both the Germans and the Allied forces can all hear those radio signals. But the problem is, is you don't really know what they're saying because it's somewhat encrypted, right? Uh, but the problem is, is that radio signals have to be encoded in some sort of mechanism. And they're not encrypted as well as they could be almost ever, right? Which is why they were able to crack the Enigma machine. Uh, if if I open up Tor Chat, Tor Chat is a radio um, chat that shares uh, radio frequencies. So you open up a chat room on your computer and you broadcast out your radio frequencies. That chat has a preamble. So uh, when it connects, radio waves have something called a preamble, which is like a seven or eight byte um, signal that you know comes before the actual radio frequency to delineate it from background noise like cosmic radiation or fm radio stations or something like that that allows the receiving end to be like hey wait i've just received like the eight magic bytes i know that i'm now receiving a radio communication and most radio signals have that preamble and that preamble is never encrypted because if you encrypt the preamble then it's just like a tcp header you know it won't get to its address um, and this is sort of the same thing about you know allowing someone to listen in on a uh, like on a physical TCP network. Uh, radio waves work the same way, except for you don't need physical access because radio waves are broadcasted 360 direction, um, you know, indiscriminately. This low key makes me want to go war driving again. Yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. found this more interesting than I thought I would for some reason. This is this has been really interesting for me. <laughs> That's because the description changed at the last minute. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> it's, because it's, an, it's because it's an aspect of security that isn't like overly inundated with a bunch of vendors and stuff trying to sell you something to secure it with. Yeah. Well, it's like it's as low tech as it is. It's still high tech. Like the attacks are high tech, but you're you're attacking something that's I don't well, I don't know. I don't want to say low tech, I guess, but it feels like it's less complicated than it should be. The the big the large issue of what we're working with is that one uh, critical infrastructure is built uh, you know years ago. So uh, I spend most of my time thinking about how to con like how to secure s systems built like the nineteen nineties. Um, and back then, you didn't have all of the security features that we have today. Now, if all critical infrastructure systems were built with Windows 10, it would be a lot easier to do because there's a lot more security functionality inside Windows 10. Windows allow, like now allows for all sorts of customization. Unfortunately, everything is running like Windows 98, Windows 2003 server, and Windows XP, and you have things like, okay, Windows XP has a billion vulnerabilities that you can explore exploit that haven't been patched because it's not you know it's end of life and the newer stuff uses windows 7 which just became end of life which means that this year going forward we're going to start seeing a lot more vulnerabilities for windows 7 that are going to get patched uh and now i have a bunch of secure like critical infrastructure systems that run off windows 7 
including the entire United States Navy. And <laughs> we're gonna have to figure out about like compensating controls. So how do I add third party controls? Well, PLCs don't have enough horsepower to do encryption or authentication. Okay, well, how do I function like on top of that? Modbus is a completely like almost every ICS protocol is complete clear text. Uh, well, how do I do authentication? Well, what if I put a, like a device gateway in line in front of PLC devices that do the authentication for them and then pass it on sort of like a firewall? Okay, well, I don't know. Like I have to sort of build like a some sort of certificate authority structure into the environment. Um, but it's going to be third party. It's going to be an add-on. Uh, you can't sort of, there's no patches and we're not going to buy a new one because we spent $89 million on our last control system. So we're not going to update it until it literally breaks down. It doesn't work anymore. So it's it's fun because it's like finding all of the layers of Swiss cheese that lay over each other so that there are no more holes. <laughs> Feels like a good way to put it. Uh, sad. 74 stacks deep. Yeah. Um, if there's no more questions from chat, Adam, I think we're handed over to you for closeout.